Check a board, check a board. Do you know how long it's been since I've seen your face? Check a board, check a board. Do you realize that at this very moment I'm going through our scrapbook and wondering why? Don't you pick up my calls when I call you. I speak to you multiple times a week, every week, and it's really about bullshit. So when I call you, it's actually to discuss something important for either the show or a career or maybe life. Because, like, we're friends. And it'd be great if I could just speak to you. Like, what the hell, man? I mean, when was the, uh, I'm trying to look here. When was the last time you called me? It was Tuesday. Tuesday night. I think. And I was drunk. And I needed to be picked up. And you were the only one around. Oh, this was Tuesday at 7.02 p.m. You want to know where I was? I hope I know the answer. I was working. That's why I didn't pick up the phone. What? Working? Who is dumb enough to hire you besides me? Uh, MLB Advanced Media. (laughs) That that explains it. Yes. That explains it. So, So let me get this straight. You went... To go work for the Milwaukee Brewers, but really to watch the Yankees. And by the Yankees, I mean Derek Jeter, right? Pretty much, yeah. All right. Why did you run onto the field, though? <laughs> well, thankfully, when I run on the field, I get to go past security because I actually have the badge. Um, however, I'm not allowed on the field during game time. So the fan that ran on the field was not me. I was just on the field for the pregame stuff. But it looks just like you. I, I would have... recognize that butt cheek mole anywhere. <laughs> Thank you, but I don't actually think he loses his pants in the video. He does in my mind. Okay, well that just makes it funnier. <laughs> Jacob. No. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you sir. Oh. I've said so many words already. I was going to say the funniest thing about it is the bar down video of of the kid like this kid has his iPhone out and he's videotaping the other kid who's going to run in the field. And it's just like, oh, yeah, just do yeah. it, do it, just do it, just do it. And then finally he just runs out in the field. It's great. Because everybody, what is it? Twitter doesn't acknowledge it. The, the announcers don't now, now acknowledge it. The video cameras don't ever pan onto them. So the only people who actually know that a fan runs on the field is people at the game. So it's cool when like the fans get the video of it so people can actually see what happens. Would you rather be tackled by CC Sabathia at full rage or tased suddenly by a cop from behind? Oh, I love, I wanted to be tased. Why? I just feel like, I don't know, I just feel like it'd be kind of fun to get tased. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but I All right, all right. Well, you're near, you're near an outlet right now, right? I mean, so lick your finger. Well, I have been electrocuted before. Go on. Then, yeah. It was just like a tingling sensation all up my arm. That was pretty much it. Maybe I should lick my finger. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but in all seriousness, sir, we have yeah. our very first guest in a very long time. I, I think it's been like three months since we've had a guest. I think and it's been, yeah, since before the Olympics. Would you like to do the honors? Sure. Our guest today is our very first Carolina Hurricane fan, a.k.a. Kaniac, and his name is Patrick Clark. Patrick, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, fellas. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great. I can't reach the socket. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> I'm so tall. Why can't I reach it? Are you trying to lean over You're like just to get to the wall, or are you trying to go up top? <laughs> later <laughs> my cat is entertained at least in any event patrick clark who the hell are you uh <laughs> good question especially when you use the intro as you know honored guest <laughs> um so i live down in the carolinas in durham you know home of the famous movie bull durham mm-hmm. and uh hockey fan all my life and uh like you, Matt, fellow MBSW listener, I think that's kind of how we got, you know, struck up a correspondence. And, uh, yes, I think, uh, I think 
we really got a huge conversation going the uh the day Kirk Muller got canned as head coach and uh just kind of go from there. Got a got way too much useless hockey information in my head to go unused, so you know, I was thrilled to, you know, come on and join you guys. There's absolutely no such thing as too much useless hockey information. <laughs> yeah. Go well, on. I, I'm not winning a lot of uh, trivia nights or, you know, stupid bets with friends with it lately, so it's not it's not going used. Oh, uh, well, I feel like we can find some more uh, man-sized plush mascots you could challenge. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, Patrick... If there's one consistency to the show besides me singing to Jacob to open it, um, it's that the guest gets to tell us about their hockey beginning. And we would like to know, Patrick Clark, what is your hockey beginning? Well, uh, I spent, you know, the first few years of my life in upstate New York, and that's kind of where I, I caught the hockey buzz. You know, I spent time like other people, you know, had one winter where I had a rink in the backyard and learned to skate. And, but I never played organized hockey, actually, until I moved to North Carolina. I'm kind of the exception to, wow. to the rule. Uh, yeah, I was a huge baseball player. and You know, the seasons never corresponded. So, yeah. So um, I think I was a you know freshman in high school, and I blew up my shoulder one year. So the next year, um, I actually had a coach. He's from New York, like me, and uh, the year before, he had actually started a, a high school hockey team. He, he was able to find uh, 15, 16 guys uh, all within one school in North Carolina, throw together a little house league team. And from that, you know, I kind of joined on the next year, and I was terrible. I mean, I was beyond terrible. You know, I was like the guy playing with a couple uh, – Playing with a bunch of travel caliber players just learning to skate. It was worse than some men's league games. Uh, that's impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, normally I would say, come on now, but that, that's an impressive denotation. <laughs> <laughs> Only because now, you know, after, you know, probably by my senior year, I turned into a pretty decent player. I could actually score. I could actually skate. And I went on to play some club hockey uh, in college and, uh, now I find myself on the other end of that spectrum where I'm a pretty decent player and then, you know, new guys coming on that are just, oh, they could barely do a crossover, you know, to save their <laughs> oh, lives. Yeah. When you were, when you were learning how to do crossovers and when you were learning how to uh, skate backwards, did you have a fear of, of destroying your ankles as well? No, none. Mainly because like the, the first probably, season that I played, I was using gear that was probably meant for a, you know, a peewee player. <laughs> and somehow I, I think it absolutely destroyed or ruined my body then. So, you know, after a year or two, I had a summer job. I could afford, you know, decent stuff after that. So I would bust, bust my ass a bunch, but I would, I would, you know, no fear after that point. What was the hardest thing for you to learn? Or what, rather, what was the hardest uh, hockey mechanic for you to learn? It's probably gap control. Oh, by my By my senior year, you know, I started out, like anybody as a newbie, you're a forward if you start later in life, just because you can't skate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And what happened is I kind of developed – into a decent, like, third-line checking center, if you will. And I could win a face-off. I could, you know, tie up another guy. And over time, you know, I had one coach that I played on a different, you know, summer league team one year, and he wanted me to play defense. And that learning to, like, not, you know, back up so far away so you're basically giving a guy complete room to roam around was tough because, you know, early on you always felt like you were going to get burned even yeah. by the slowest skaters. Oh, that's really interesting. I, I expected something like a slap shot or um, saucer passes or, or stopping the 
whenever I'm teaching somebody how to play hockey or how to skate, it is such a mental hurdle for the people that I teach to stop yeah, and stopping, do crossovers and to skate back. Stopping is probably the big one I saw because later, you know, later on I ended up becoming a decent enough skater. I, I taught some skating classes when I was finishing college just to, you know, have some beer money. Mm-hmm. And luckily I skied growing up as a kid. Ah, and so there was a uh, little uh, bit uh, of uh, crossover there. Yeah. Actually, I thought, I thought that there was a lot of crossover because yeah, when I was a, younger I in life, was. yeah, oh, I'm glad that we're, we're all in consensus is that I thought it was, there was a surprising amount of crossover. Obviously, you know, a meter long utensil at the bottom of my foot versus, um, a 12 inch long knife on the bottom of my foot is different, but like the, the, the motion of the mechanic was nearly identical. The process to turning out your foot from the foot itself all the way up to the hip was was uh, identical enough, um, as well as the, the element of fear, because, you know, in skiing, you're always in extreme amounts of danger because it could be the, the co-passengers on the mountain, or it could be a tree, it could be a patch of ice, it could be a rock, it could be, again, you have no idea what's coming. You're, you only have one field of view, and you can't really do anything about it either. If you're on a steep mountain, that everything's speeding up all the time. And so, like, when I was a kid, and I was a, I was scared of everything as a kid, but going down a mountain, like, I, I was always so scared because I didn't know what to expect to go wrong, and then nothing would, and that built up my confidence. So then when I translated that to hockey, oh, and by the way, I learned how to ski before I played hockey. When I translated that over to hockey, um, I felt like I had – like a sense of where everything was and, and like the basic understanding how to do it. So like those more difficult hockey mechanics came a lot easier to me than uh, what it appears to come to people um, who not me, which was well put. Yeah. Yeah. When I was learning how to ski, I was also learning how to snowboard because I wasn't quite sure which one I wanted to do. And <laughs> it was so much easier to ski than it was the snowboard, and I think a lot of it is because of how similar hockey stopping is to turning and controlling your speed going down on skis. And uh, I, I was just like you, Matt. I thought that he, uh, Patrick was going to say something like stopping was going to be the hardest thing because I know when I'm teaching people how to skate, that's the hardest thing. They always, they just can't they can't just fathom going full speed and all of a sudden turning their body and like putting them in in a vulnerable position where they could fall down, especially if they're going kind of fast into boards and mm-hmm. Um, I think that that happens a lot more with the people who are learning, learning how to skate when they're older, more so when they're like four or five, because when they're four or five, their kids are just like, okay, whatever. And then they just kind of do it. Yeah. So Patrick, when you were about four or five and, and probably playing baseball on a ski mountain instead, uh, did you think about hockey much at all? Because, you know, we don't know each other that well yet, yet. Give it some time. <laughs> but it seems as though hockey has become your primary at, uh, sporting passion, and yet it was the last one to come along. Yeah, that's that's the perfect description for me. Um, oh, thank you. I was, I was definitely interested in hockey, but no one in my family uh, really was around the game or played more than just, you know, playing in a parking lot or, you know, playing on a pond when, you know, it was actually safe to play in ponds. You know, I wasn't that far north. But uh, I don't know. Something about it always attracted me. I don't know whether it was just uh, in, in, uh, living in upstate New York, there was no shortage of games on in the winter. And, you know, I was basically stuck inside because of blizzards half the time. So, it's better than watching, you know, NBA basketball. And, At least for me. And it that, that remains to be true even to today. And like I enjoy playoff basketball and I enjoy like any quality game. Like if you put me in front of a quality sporting event, I can enjoy it at least in that singular evening or event. But I, I I can never seem to get over the fact that, all right, it's the first quarter and there's about 200 game points left to go to see who wins. 
I don't know. I think the biggest thing for me, when speaking of basketball, is just how how long the final thirty seconds of a game takes and how how slow it is. If you guys know what I'm talking about, yeah. And oh, I that's absolutely. that's like when we were talking about how the how uh, hockey is was always like something that fascinated you. That's how it was for me. And then uh, comparing it to other sports that up here, at least in Milwaukee. Basketball is very big, and it's just uh, while I like college basketball, especially Marquette basketball, I can't get into the NBA just by how long it takes. Because we were, I think we were watching uh, a round one playoff game, and I think it was the Blue Jackets Pens final game, and a NBA basketball game, and the final seven minutes of the hockey game took longer than the final, or was shorter than the final minute of the NBA basketball game. It was just ridiculous. I saw a study a few weeks ago, and I, I gotta dig it back up, but, um, going back like the last 20 years, an NBA and, uh, D1 college, the last minute of a game on average took like five, uh, to ten real life minutes. That's ridiculous. That shouldn't happen. Yeah. But in any event, so we're, we're talking about Patrick and we're talking about the Carolina Hurricanes. I don't think I quite understand why Kirk Muller got fired. I think, I think it's because the Carolina Hurricanes didn't make the playoffs. That's just my, my suspicion. But to me, that always seemed like a dumb reason because it's the players who dictate whether or not you make the playoffs in hockey. And, uh, Patrick, before I turn it over to you, I want to say this. I've been trying to think about what a coach is in the various sports. And, uh, baseball as a manager is really the only one that actually describes the function of that person. Football is, there's a head coach and then, um, a series of subsidiary coaches. Basketball or NBA in particular. There's a head coach and maybe an assistant or two, but they're they're truly secondary. Uh, in hockey, it seems as though there's a primary coach, the head coach, and then a few subsidiary coaches, and that changes from team to team. But the manager in baseball, and although there's the pitching coach and the base coaches, etc., the manager itself is really the only one that dictates strategy and deployment of talent. And I, maybe I just haven't studied it well enough. And I don't know if you know how to answer this, Patrick, but was there something fundamentally uh, erroneous with the way that Kirk Muller deployed the talent or communicated to the talent on Carolina? I would say yes to both answers. And what that and what that created here was just a lot of ebbs and flows over the course of the season. So I think ultimately Kirk Muller was fired because the Hurricanes over the course of three wacky, crazy seasons were consistently inconsistent. You know, there was ne- there were no constants, whether it was on a goal, uh, who your primary scores were, where your scoring was coming from. There's nothing dependable coming from the team day in, day out. The one things that they weren't doing were going on long winning streaks or, you know, showing consistent improvement as time went on, which you'll see, like, Philadelphia might be a good example. They played garbage the first, you know, two weeks of the season and then, things slowly got better and better and better as things went on. You know, mm-hmm. part of that was because, you know, Claude Giroux was probably holding a stick a little too tight trying to score goals, you know, once Peter Laviolette was fired. Um, mm-hmm. but Ray Emery hadn't gotten into a fight yet. And, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, that's like putting on a condom before you have sex. I mean, you just, you know, there's, there's an order of operations. Yeah, too bad he skipped two because he had to find a willing combatant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for going along with there that. There you go. That was nice. <laughs> yes. Right. 
So, I mean, Kirk Muller lost his job in part because they didn't make the playoffs, but because, you know, what's there to build on, you know? I was probably in the minority of fans down here that wanted to see him return for, you know, a second full season. You know, he started, you know, December uh, the 2012-2013 season. Then there was the, or, yeah, 2012-2013. Then there was the lockout. This was his first full season. And he finished with a hockey 500 record. He still lost more games than he won, but yeah, thank God for the loser point. Uh, yeah. but the big thing is he, he seemed like a first time head coach here. Yeah. And he, unfortunately, I think, you know, the team's been subpar lo- too long for him to survive another year to kind of work things out. He'd be the great, he's going to get this team so far and then the next guy comes in and somehow brings them to, you know, the next level. That that's kind of what his fate was always going to be, you know. Looking back in hindsight. So then, where do you think the Hurricanes move forward from here? Like, who do you want the coach to be? Um, I would love either of Los Angeles's assistants, um, Davis Payne and John Stevens. Uh, okay. I'd love a crack at either of those guys. Uh, both are former head coaches. Mm-hmm. Both had successful, semi-successful, you know, regular seasons with their respective clubs in St. Louis and Philadelphia. But those were both their first time, you know, head coaching opportunities. Things didn't get on right at the end, and they were shown the door. Then they've worked in a winning environment for a while. You know, Stevens was there throughout the cup run. I think Dave Payne was Payne, there as well. Payne was there as well. So, you know, it can't hurt to have that winning experience as a coach, you know. Certainly. Um, but the question is, you know, if, you know, L.A.'s down three games to two now, if they somehow come back, you know, make a run for the Cup, can the Canes afford to wait that long? You know, the big names that are going to be thrown around and around Carolina is all Samuelson because he played with Ron Francis during in the Pittsburgh days. Uh, Kevin Deneen, because right now he doesn't have an NHL job, and I'm sure unless Hockey Canada is throwing him a boatload of money, you know, I'm sure he's itching to get back in. Um, so those are the two names I'd like to look at first. Uh, I'm not sure Barry Trotz is the guy. I know he's ha- he's at least had some conversations with Ron Francis so far. Uh, that's public out in the media, but. I think he's a better fit somewhere else, uh, just because there isn't a great core of players that you can identify here defensively to work, you know, the way the Predators teams have for the last, you know, I would say 10 years. So those two guys are the first ones I look at. I, I want them to go NHL ready. You know, I'm not keen on them bringing up someone from the AHL right now. That seems like a great mid-season. You have to make a, a, a coaching move. Mm-hmm. Uh, but not, you know, after f- four four or five years outside of the playoffs. Like, Carolina mirrors a lot of what's happening in Edmonton. Really? You know? I think so. So I hadn't thought of it that way. So both teams went to the cup final in 06. Mm-hmm. You know, Carolina's made one playoff appearance since – you know, Oilers have been, you know, kept out. The big thing is about right around 2010, end of 2009, 2010, somewhere in there, they decided, all right, we're, we're going to rebuild. So the year before Carolina made the playoffs, they cast it off, you know, every veteran they had on the roster and acquired any, you know, late round draft pick they could kind of stockpile their their system. Uh, Edmonton won a couple draft lotteries, finished with abysmal records, and they've slowly been building up, you know, cores of players. Oilers have seen them more in the NHL. Carolina's slowly trickling in here and there. I guess, you know, 
2014-15 will be the fifth year of these so-called rebuilds. And that seems to be the year where teams are kind of making their turns. You know, this this past season was year five of uh, Colorado stockpiling a bunch of players, you know, and then developing them in the NHL. Uh, and all of a sudden they caught lightning in a bottle. Well, you know, you're making a lot of interesting points because uh, when I look at this, uh, the underside of, of the talent pool, uh, what I've seen and what I've read of, say, Elias Lindholm is that he's a legitimate NHL player. Uh, perhaps he won't be the 30 goal scorer like Jeff Skinner, but, uh, he should be a quality, uh, second tier player. You've got one of the elite defensive forwards in Malhotra. Lakhtyanov, uh, needs to figure out if he's a, uh, an NHLer or not, and that could bring out the best in people. Uh, if you want to put a, a positive spin on it, Andre Sakara uh, has announced himself onto the NHL scene and is now inignorable. Justin Falk was an Olympian, and there are several defensemen uh, like Jay Harrison, uh, for example, who they are—they are not flashy, they are not all stars, but they are steady. And uh, in his particular case, he's keep. Uh, he's cheap, rather. And, and finally, if you're a believer in Kudobin, and I am, there's a goaltending tandem at the absolute worst to look forward to. So, the, so I guess what I'm getting at is that there's a foundation to start working off of, and it goes deeper than just having the stalls uh, this time around. Oh, absolutely. So everyone looks at this team as defined by their top six, and it's usually the two stalls, Alexander Semen, Jeff Skinner, and whoever your, you know, second line left, right wing might be mm-hmm. on any given week. And at least in the Hurricanes standpoint, it's always been, you know, a different player each and every week. No, they definitely have a young core of players under 25, and that includes Jordan Stahl. You know, I I would like to to okay. see the marketplace kind of separate Jordan and Eric as this, you know, symbiotic relationship. As one goes, the other goes. You know, if, you know, you're into advanced stats, you know, Jordan Stahl really didn't have that bad a year. No, not at all. When you look at it, especially when you consider he's playing with third-line defensive First guy in Patrick Dwyer, um, who was, uh, you know, a guy that played in the world championships last year and he's, he's a prototypical role player, you know, great fourth line guy on a playoff team. But, you know, his, his offensive ceiling is capped at, you know, 10 or 15 goals. Meanwhile, I bet you the, the Penguins would love to have him over Craig Adams at this point. Oh, now I, I do have a fondness for Craig Adams uh, from his time in 2006 with the Canes, but I agree with you. You know, there's a there's a short lifespan for guys like that. And the Canes problem is their roster is filled with identical players that you kind of meet that same role. And even when you play in with the most talented players, like an Eric Stahl, for example, you're only going to get so much production out of them. When they're over slotted. Yeah. And it's going to hamper the entire team's production. Yeah. Jake, I, w- I want to hear what you have to say about this, but I want to make um, one more point. If you look at the back of Brian Boyle's hockey card, you'll see that he randomly has a 20 plus goal season. And that was, and I'm not looking at it right now, but I believe that was 2008. And that was a season in which the Rangers were absolutely decimated by injury. The, just throughout the whole lineup. Like we had Gabrick for like 12 games that year, 20 games. And why did he score that much? Because for 60 or 70 games that season, he was the first line center. He was getting all the opportunities. And if you need to play somebody that much, we know Brian Boyle is not a uh, top six player. If you need to play somebody that much to maybe get that amount of production out of him, it doesn't matter if you play him with uh, Sidney Crosby or Eric Stahl. The dude, the guy's just capped. He's just not that kind of player. And so to have that much 
uh, roster overlap with that kind of player, uh, I mean, you're, you're just capping yourself. Yeah, I think that uh, – I definitely think that Carolina has a lot of upside. Um, and, you, I mean, you already talked about Eric Stahl, Jordan Stahl, and, and uh, Alexander Summit as, like, the big top three. Uh, and, I mean, Eric Stahl is j- – he's finishing up about the lighter half of his – prime because he, I mean, he's 29 right now and so uh I think that what's the the core that they have the young core and the younger guys coming in they definitely need to pull a Colorado in the sense that they need to get the the guys that they've been trying to stem out for the next two three years to kind of get them up in the NHL and get them that experience so that way they can start uh doing well um and I definitely think that guys like Justin Falk who had the uh had the U.S. experience this year, that's definitely going to help them in the, in moving forward, uh, only at the age of 22. So I think where Carolina is really going to, going to help better themselves in the next couple of years is, um, I definitely think that they need to get these AHL guys up. And I think that possibly even get rid of Ward for some, for some prospects. Cause I mean, Kubo didn't like Matt, you've already talked about how you're a big believer in him. I believe in him too. And I think getting Ward out there and, getting some top level prospects or even NHL ready guys right away would be a great way for the team to get kind of get back into the fight and back into the playoffs. Patrick, other than Ryan Murphy and Keegan Lowe, who could we be looking forward to as coming on to the big stage? Well, next year he might be making the jump, but maybe Brock McGinn. Uh, Such a great name. (laughs) It is. You know, he's the, the youngest of the three McGinn brothers, you know, one's in Philadelphia, one's in Colorado. The one in Philadelphia is a piece of shit, but it's really, <laughs> but once he leaves Philadelphia, he'll be great. Yeah, that's pretty much the Philly MO. Uh, <laughs> but right now he just had like a, a ridiculous 40 goal season with, uh, Guelph in the OHL. He's on his way to the Memorial Cup. Uh, so he'll be playing. Hopefully, you know, on NHL net in the next couple of week, two weeks. So, you know, more people can get to see him play. But maybe someone like that, uh, maybe, uh, not to be confused with the basketball player, but Michael Jordan, uh, <laughs> Czech, Czech defenseman who's been with the organization for about five years. Uh, it's pretty much, you know, he's had a couple cups of coffee. Here and there, done all right. But he, what about for, Jared Stahl? I think we might have seen the last of Jared Stahl with the no! organization. No, you got to get the trifecta together. No, uh, no, you're gonna tell me the same thing about Brett Sutter as well. How about oh, Victor Rask? Well, uh, here I'll, I'll I'll say this: Brett Sutter could easily be. A replacement for Manny Mel Holcher if he's not resigned because he's a pending UFA. That right. said, let's hope they resign him. No, Sutter's a great, he's a great role player who, whose ceiling's probably third line center. You know, he's seen his offensive production at the HL level go up each of the past three years since he joined the organization. Uh, so there might be room for him. Uh, Jared Stahl. There just wasn't a, enough uh, <laughs> talent to go around for four. No. no <laughs> he, I, I think it's such a crime that he only made it to the A. Yeah, you know, last year he had his he he had his two game call up and they they let him change his number to thirteen. So when the starting lineups were announced, it was number eleven, number twelve, number thirteen, <laughs> starting for the final two games, but. uh he, he is, he might be a journeyman for a while and may find success in, as like an NHL fourth liner, but it might take him a few more years. Uh, he was injured about half the season, didn't get a huge number of games in the AHL. So, you know, I think, I think the Hurricanes have seen the last of Jared Stahl on their lineup. Well, that is unless they, you know, pull some stupid trade and get somehow convinced Mark Stahl to, Come down here. Uh, well, it's interesting that you uh, bring up Mark in that 
I mean, I guess that was kind of predictable, but I, I wasn't anticipating it. He wants to be re-signed over the summer, and he still has another season left on his contract after um, whenever this particular season ends, which will not be tonight. But in <laughs> in any event, he's making a shade under four million, and I'm thinking, what does it take to keep Mark Stahl? Because he doesn't say. I want to be re-signed this summer if he doesn't want to stay. He only says that if he wants to stay in New York. So, okay, he wants to stay in New York, or he wants to stay with the Rangers specifically. He's got to get bumped up to, like, four, between four and a half and five and a half per. Uh, McDonough is signed at 4.7. Girardi is signed at 5.5. So he's going to get in that range through the rest of about rest of the decade. That is not so bad for your your number three defenseman who is a number one on just about any team. But I, the only way he goes to Carolina is if he demands it. The only way he stays in New York is if he demands it. Like I I don't see what the Rangers would ask for in return, and that's not just of the Hurricanes, it'd be of anybody, because as the depth of the Rangers' defense goes, so has the team. Because as you can see, we don't score very much during the playoffs. You know, Rick Nash doesn't have a goal yet. It would be cool. It'd, it'd be cool to see him re-sign, and I think it'd also be interesting to see the all-Hurricane tradition of family first continue. <laughs> Well, I think you're in luck, Matt, because I, I personally think Mark wants to stay in New York. I think he kind of wants to do his own thing and not be part of some sideshow with his brothers. You know, I think it'd be a different thing if the Hurricanes were perennially, you know, in the playoffs on a team where he has success. But why, why leave a good thing right now, you know? All right. You know, it's different in Jordan's case where he had already won a cup and he knew his ceiling on that team pending injuries was still third line center. So, you know, his professional goals were, you know, much different place. And I think in the next season or two, you, I, I actually think next season you're going to see Jordan Stahl become the number one center on, on the Hurricanes. And whether that's, you know, Eric Stahl turning into the next Vinny LeCavalier turning into a decent two-way number two center, which he had to do when Stamkos was drafted. Um, Eric Stahl is going to have to accept a lesser role moving forward because I think he's he's still a guy that could play for seven or eight years, but you know he's not going to. He's not. He's never going to eclipse more than an eighty-point season moving forward. So, but that said, I, th I think Mark st stays in New York. You know, you stay with the guys like Girardi and McDonough, and you have a good defensive core. And as long as Lundqvist's there, you know they're they're drafting a ton of great college forwards. So I think under Elaine Vigneault, scoring is going to slowly increase in the next probably two seasons. Yeah, I have to agree with Patrick. I don't think that. Mark is going to leave New York at all. I think he's going to get around a five-year range. Or not, yeah, five-year, five million dollar range. Um, and I think, especially if he wins a cup in the next, when, whenever this contract, however long this contract goes, I could see him maybe as a sort of swan song sort of deal going down to Carolina or wherever the rest of his brothers are and finishing up his NHL career with Eric and Jordan. Um, but I, I, Totally agree. I don't think Mark wants to be down in Carolina where the name, the Jordan Stalls come before the team itself. And I think that he wants to, he wants to win a cup and he wants to be on a team that's going to give him the best chance to do that. And Carolina just isn't there as much as I think he'd like to play with his brothers. I think he'd much rather win, win a cup and like figure out what, do what he came in the NHL to do, which was be on a team that won a cup, and I think he's gonna, I think he, that's gonna be a big reason why he stays in, in New York. Alright, boys, well then we just need, um, 16 minus 7 is 9 more wins, and we're there. There you go. 
starting tonight. All right. Well, Patrick, uh, I know you got to go be a father right now. And I thank you very much for coming on with us and sharing uh, us your, your hockey origins and lending us some perspective of what's going on down in Raleigh. And I, I hope to have you on again soon. Well, great, Matt, Jacob. Thanks for having me on. I loved it. Thank you. He's out. All right. Jake? Yes. That was fun. That was very fun. I think that's the first time we've had a guest uh, only on for part of the show. Yeah, but, I mean, it's not that bad. And it's it's fine. Yeah, that's that was fun. I agree. Hey, uh, one more thing though about yep. um, what you and Patrick were saying about uh, Mark and perhaps he's uh, and his perspective on what's going on. And oh, that was nice. Thanks, fellas. Had a blast. Yep. Smiley face. <laughs> uh. I was just saying, oh, well, it, one more thing on the perspective that you and Patrick shared about, uh, Mark, perhaps his perspective on viewing, uh, his brother's time down in Carolina is I had not thought about it in those terms. It stalls before the hurricanes. Mm-hmm. It's family before the hurricanes. I hadn't thought about it that explicitly. I sort of just lumped it together as a simultaneous experience. Uh, experience and boy if he has even an inkling of that perception or that thought and surely he does Mm -hmm. then it seems as though Carolina would be one of the last places he would ever demand a trade to or sign with as a free agent right and I think that lends a bit of an insight into why certain big name free agents don't go home. Vinny Le Cavalier. Oh, by the way, um, I hadn't thought about Le Cavalier and Eric Stahl in the same breath that you two spoke and spoke about them. That was really interesting and something I'd like to come back to at, at a later date. Yep. Um, but just for example, because I'm a Ranger fan, Rick Nash not going home to Toronto. Because then it would be Rick Nash and the Toronto Maple Leafs. And if he doesn't want that, if he wants to be it to be Team X that also has Rick Nash, as opposed to Rick Nash who's on or who is Team Y, I think that's one of the big reasons why we see players not going home. Well, I think it's not necessarily players not going home because, I mean... The stalls aren't from Carolina. Yeah. I mean, it's just the fact that it's both right now it's both stalls. And then when the third stall came around, it's like, oh, it's the stall family that's playing for the Hurricanes. And I mean, outside of Alexander Semin, who just got to the team and Jeff Skinner, I mean, the, the face of the Carolina Hurricanes is the stall brothers. And so that's why I think they're becoming synonymous. And if Mark would go down there, it'd almost be it's the Stahl brothers and the rest of the Hurricanes. Um, but I don't think you'd see that, I mean, because I'm from St. Louis. I don't think you'd see the same thing if Paul Stasny coming home to St. Louis. I don't think it'd be Paul Stasny who was on the St. Louis Blues. I think it'd be it's the St. Louis Blues with St. Louis native Paul Stasny because that's what you saw when Ben Bishop was on the Blues. It wasn't Ben Bishop and the St. Louis Blues. It was... St. Louis Blues and fellow St. Louis and Ben Bishop. I just learned two things: how to conjugate uh, St. Louis into St. Louisan, as well as that Paul Stastny is from St. Louis. Yep, his, uh, he was born when his dad was playing in St. Louis, and actually Paul Stastny and Ben Bishop played on the same high school hockey team. The more you know. Yep. All right. Well, from a trio of brothers to the newest newcomer to the block, sir. I give you Jonathan Gibson. Yes. I love hype as much as the next person. It's fun. It catches your attention. I usually let it go in one ear and out the other, though, because so frequently something goes awry. He doesn't live up to the hype. The last time I recall somebody living up to the hype was, oh, shit, that was Nathan McKinnon. 
I was going to say LeBron, but like, oh, it's uh, Nathan. Who's Nathan? Anyway, it's it also now kid. John Gibson, sir. It is the most interesting way a person can burst onto a scene as the goaltender in the middle of a rivalry playoff matchup when that team, in this case the Ducks, are trailing in the series. Like this has all of the hallmarks. Yeah, it's I mean I knew that what was it, Mike Milberry brought it up when Frederick Frederick Anderson got the start over Jonas Hiller in the first round uh of the playoffs in game one of the first round against the um the stars. And he was talking about how what what if they bring up Gibson and I remember me and my friend talking, it's like it was not a smart I don't we didn't think it'd be a smart move to bring up John Gibson because if something goes wrong, he could derail his career because he has such promise and he has such like he's the next Jonathan, Jonathan Quick. I almost said Jonathan Quick. Jonathan Quick. Um Well that's how he says it when he takes out his ventures. <laughs> it's it's just I Again, very rarely do players actually live up to all the hype that they have, and John Gibson is doing it on the biggest stage. And it's awesome to watch because he's been lights out. I mean, okay, granted, the Kings scored three goals against them last game, but still, he played very well. And he's and, played pretty And two of them were after the Ducks were at, up 4 1 already. They were in the right. second half of the game. The third one was late in the third. And I don't want to call it garbage time because in playoffs there is no such thing, but it wasn't <laughs> it, it was high leverage time. Right. Uh, my impression of John Gibson so far is that so far he knows how to track the puck with great efficiency and he knows how to position himself well. And those are not unique statements for goaltenders. I understand. I think that at as a 20 year old, as your first taste in all of this, everything that he's going through right now. I think that those are the two most impressive feats because the poise, I'm, I guess I'll go against the grain a little bit on this one. But when it comes to poise, if you are engulfed in what you're doing in the task you are trying to achieve and the uh, goal for him, which is uh, an ironic uh, piece of verbiage, is that his whole job is to stop the puck. That's it. That's according to an article that I just read about him in Ingle magazine. Those are his words. So he has that engulfing mindset to just stop the puck. And he's always in position, whether it's a, whether, you know, the puck is at the point, or it's on the goal line to crash it in that, or they're pulling a one timer. He is so consistently in just the right position to give himself the optimal chance to make that save. That, to me, has been the most impressive impressive thing through his first what's it two or three starts. Yeah, I actually like hadn't paid that much attention to it, but now that you you mention it. He is always in position to make it safe, and he's always like, no matter where the puck is, he's already, he's always set up, ready to go in case there is a shot. And I think that's part. I think that's a big reason why he's having success. And I think you hit it right on the head. Thank you. It was appreciated. Um, when it comes to this series, though, it looks like the Ducks have figured out the the Kings, or more specifically. When it comes to this series, it, it looks like the Ducks have figured out Jonathan Quick. And Jonathan Quick has two tricks, and they're great tricks. Uh, play very deep in net, take away everything from his hips down, force them to go up high where his blocker and glove are. Or he's going to challenge the shooter from the bottom of the circle um, sometimes even more so, but between the top of the crease and the bottom of the circle. And the Ducks have to figure out a way to get a tap in behind him or to freeze him in that pose and walk around him, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that with, well, not great efficiency, but more efficiency than we're used to seeing against Jonathan Quick. 
Yeah, I think that just comes with familiarity because I mean these teams are these teams are rivals and they played each other five times in the play even before the playoffs started. So this is going to be what game number eleven for them now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that just comes with knowing your opponent and knowing how to beat them. And I think that's I don't I don't think it's saying that Quick has gotten bad. It's just I mean you said it right. It's that the Ducks have figured it out, and when you have that kind of familiarity with them, it's you know exactly how to beat them and it's just all a matter of Jonathan Quick uh adapting to that and I don't think he's been adapting to it as quickly as the Kings would have liked and part of that is also in front of on the opposite side John Gibson the the Kings have only faced him two three times so they're having a little bit of a tougher time figuring out what his quirks are and how to beat him and stuff like that and so I think game six and seven there should be a little bit more scoring uh or Quick and Gibson could just again shut down the lights and and only be a well like a one nothing or a two one game, um, but yeah I think it's you're going to see that the Kings are starting to be able to figure out Gibson a little bit more, um, and they're going to be able to net a couple more goals. But it's just the Ducks being able to the, knowing Quick's little gives and knowing how to beat them and how to do it efficiently. And while there's certainly more detail to it than that, I think that these are the two most important stories to this series. It's the goaltending. And I don't believe for one second that Jonathan Quick is playing poorly. I think it's exactly what you said. And now when it comes to the Ducks goaltending, if they've got it figured out, I thought the Ducks were a deeper and better team in the first place. So it only makes sense that they're winning. Now, I want to focus on the Kings for a moment. Okay. Last week, we were briefly talking about a mutiny that is going on or was going on in the Kings locker room. And there was a divide between uh, people who wanted to play Daryl Sutter hockey and people who wanted to uh, play a more open version of uh, LA Kings hockey. And I view Daryl Sutter in even more of a hot seat than Dan Bilesma. And we'll get to Bilesma in a bit. Because of exactly that, the whispers of a mutiny, as well as, even without that, even without discontent from the roster, this roster is way better than the offensive output that they've been putting forth. Mm-hmm. Drew Doughty, right now, is fully capable of playing Shea Weber minutes. Is it not time, despite having won a cup thanks to Daryl Sutter Hockey, is it not time for a shakeup? I think I think the best way to describe what's going on in the Kings team right now and what's been going on all season is they have the right people in the wrong system. Oh, that's interesting. If that makes sense. Yeah, they go have, on. They have everybody that they need to to be a fantastic team. But the problem is, is they're not using the right system in order for that team to succeed. Meaning that the Kings are not built for a defensive first mentality. They are built for an offensive first mentality. When you have guys like Jeff Carter, Mike Richards, Marion Gabbert, Drew Doughty, Dustin Brown, they have people that could score up and down the lineup. So the problem is, is that they just need to get into a more free flow offensive sort of mentality more so than a grinded out defensive battle between their teams. And if they get into a more kind of Eastern Conference, Pittsburgh Penguins style of play, where it's a lot more creativity, a lot more passing, and a lot more using the offensive capabilities of those players, they're, you're going to see the Kings rise back right back up to the top of the league and could be a President's Trophy winning team because of how many goals they're going to be able to score. And so that's what I don't think they necessarily need to fire Daryl Sutter in the sense that they need to get assistants in there that are going to be able to play a more offensive minded game. Kind of like what, I mean, I know this is going to be a terrible example, but Carlisle in Toronto, where they keep the coach but fire all the assistants, Mm -hmm. because over in Toronto, they're talking that there's going to be a new system in place. And I think that's, I feel like the Kings could benefit that from that greatly is having a a new system in place, but with the same head at the top. Well, 
that particular result might make Patrick very happy. Yes. I think that your point is astute. And it's certainly well taken on me. And I hope because of the compilation of talent. Wow, Tess. Oh, she just did a five foot leap. <laughs> Like, like, it was nothing. She's 20. Like, five feet tall or five feet long? Long. Damn. Perfect landing as well. Well done, babe. Where'd she jump from? The table that I'm on to oh. the couch that she sleeps on. <laughs> Damn, oh. good for her. Yeah. All right. In any event. So what I hope doesn't happen, and it's because of this particular uh, accumulation of talent that's in L.A., that they don't have to revamp anything. They don't have to make wholesale changes and that they figure out the, the middle ground between uh, a change and a tweak because they are so good. They can be the Blackhawks uh, you know, or the Penguins or the Bruins. Like every year you pencil them in for a, an obvious cup contender. Right. And even if they make it through to the next round, you know, they almost will be doing it despite themselves. And you, you know, you don't want to have to say that. You don't want to have to ha- talk about the Kings the way we talk about the Penguins where, ah, oh, they're so front loaded and the coaching, ah, oh, he's terrible. The goaltending, yeah, it's pretty mediocre. No, the Kings can be even better than the Penguins. No, exactly. The Kings can be the best team in the NHL by far. Uh, and any which, and, and their next moves, whatever they are, they have to be on point. Mm-hmm. I don't think that they have the same amount of stability that St. Louis has, that Boston has, that Chicago appears to have. Um, I think that they are as fragile or as potentially fragile as Pittsburgh. Um, hey, boy, I just hate saying that. I really do. You shouldn't have to say that about a team like the Penguins or the Kings. No, it's really terrible, too. Uh, but we'll find out in due time, huh, buddy? Yep. All right, so let's move on uh, to the importance of coaching. And we'll, and we'll talk about this by way of Chicago and Minnesota. So I touched on this earlier when I was talking about the different kinds of coaches in the four major sports, but when it comes to Quenville and Yo, obviously they're on opposite ends of their careers. Quenville has three cups with multiple teams. Yep. Yo is in his third season. Right. But I find that, and and this is just casual observation, I find that Quenville has to do a lot more coaching than Yo has to do. His strategy needs to be more on point than Yo's does. And it has everything to do with roster uh, composition. And I'll break it down uh, simply like this. Quenville's roster is obviously deeper than Yo's roster. However, Yo has absolute stalwarts that you could put that you can put on for twenty to thirty minutes a night in every situation, namely in Parise and obviously Suter. Quenville doesn't have that at all. Now he has obviously Taves and Kane and Keith and etc. But they aren't capable of playing 25, 30 minutes every night. You don't want Taves in the defensive zone all of the time. And so what I find is that Yo can say, all right, we're not possessing puck. We're not dictating the flow of the game. Let's get Parise and Suter out there every other shift until we assert um, our will on the game. Whereas Quenville needs to manufacture stability from his side of the glass. What do you think? Well, I don't think really. I think the reason why Quenville is such a good coach is because he thinks of strategy and he thinks of 
how to use the play, how to use his players in the best way to better the team. Whereas Yo, yeah, he has the luxury of putting out Parise and Suter out there for 25, 30 minutes a game, but that doesn't necessarily help the team. It's all about using the individual's talents in order to improve the team as a whole. And optimizing I think that, the utility of the talent. Yeah, optimizing the talent that the players have. And I think while Yo might sometimes say, okay, these five go, you guys know what to do, sometimes it's Quinville said you need to say, Quinville will say, okay, this is exactly what we need to do, and the players then will execute it. And I think having that more strategic, strategic outlook on the game and how Quinville just always seems to have the right people on the ice at the right time and in order to execute his game plan and actually having a, an astute game plan, I think – is what separates Quinville from Yo, and that comes with having multiple years of NHL coaching experience. And I think that Yo is just—I mean, I think as Yo gets on, he'll he'll be better. But I think the real reason why the the Minnesota Wild aren't better than they are is because of the—it's not because of roster, but because of a coach that doesn't use the roster to the best of its ability. Ah, oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to being a hockey coach. I understand this isn't quite either of our fields, but when it comes to a hockey coach, like what's more important, being an in-game strategist, merely being a motivator, uh, which is, in my opinion, what Daryl Sutter is? Uh, how about a talent evaluator? What is the head coach of a hockey team's role? An NHL coach is one of scouting and adaptability and scouting in the sense that kind of preparing for what the team watching the team that they're playing. So like for instance, the wild watching the wild and seeing what their game plan is and then figuring out what's the best way to counteract that game plan. So scouting the opponent, figuring out what they do well, what they don't do well and figure out how to exploit that. And then adaptability, meaning that once the game starts, Change because never two games are never the same, and just figuring out then adapting in the middle of the game what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, how how your players are doing versus their players, matchups to make sure that the right players are against the wrong the right players on the ice, and just it's a bunch of just in game tweaks that you have to be that you have to notice and figure out how your team is going to be able to counteract that or just adapt to the game as a whole, and I think that's what the role of an NHL coach is, not necessarily teaching or uh, like, because I think a lot of growing up, it's teaching players how to do stuff like that and and actually coaching them. But I think a, a an NHL coach is more adapting and just kind of pointing out things that the players need to do better, not necessarily teaching them new things. Okay, I think we're pretty much on the same page about that. Okay. So I don't really have anything to add, but. I would really like to start having a more quantitative and qualitative conversation about what coaches do in the different sports because the baseball, I mean, in every respect and it seems like for everything is obviously the easiest one to understand. Right. And then as the games become more chaotic, they become increasingly more difficult. So from easiest to most difficult, and this is just from our perspective in terms of understanding. Uh, it would go baseball, basketball, but then a big divide. And I'll, I can accept arguments of that, then hockey, then football, or the other way around. I think it's football, then hockey, because the head coach in football disseminates so much power and strategy mm-hmm. and control in the first place that they're more of a central figure than a uh, essential figure for the coaching staff than a direct line to the players. Whereas right. the hockey coach is, um, you know, more than a manager, uh, less than a, a field general. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, guess, I suppose those aren't similes, but in any event, you, you kind of know what I mean, right? Yes, I do know exactly what you mean. All right. Well, since I don't have any more specific words for it, let's go on to a new topic. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Over under, and how many more sticks to the nuts we'll see the rest of the way? 
I just, I don't understand it. Because it didn't seem like it was such a big deal yeah. before this playoffs. And now it's just, it's ridiculous. Like, here, let me let me forward you this archive of every single stick to the nuts we've seen this postseason. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven of them. <laughs> Maybe eight. I might have counted wrong. All right. Fair warning. Uh, the initial posts, the initial gifts, rather, at the top of this post are not safe for work. Just fair warning. It's a little buffoonery, and then the, it's all the spears. Well, okay. I don't see the. I don't see the first one. I can't see the first one. You don't. You don't see the that little boy holding a sausage. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the one I see. That one's. Not, I didn't think that was bad. I'm just trying to uh, cover our ass. Yeah, it's just it. Uh, I don't. Yeah, get it. I don't. I don't get it either, and it's absolutely insane. And not to rehash what I said a few episodes ago uh, entirely, but this, this is uh, and, and each one is more egregious than the next. Yeah, I know. It's just like it's just Crosby got it like a, a couple of times, which I don't really get, but it's just. But none of these are, should be acceptable. Like, like, ah, it's just. No, oh, it's. I don't. I don't. If I if I happened to me, I would just drop my gloves and beat the shit out of them. Like I don't. But uh, because that's the only reasonable response. It's like uh, not to be punny. It's a dick move. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it's, it's so totally utterly is. disrespectful. It's so utterly cowardly. It's so utterly fucked up. I mean, like even in fights, even even in fights, you're taught as, as the unspoken rule on the playground is you don't go for the nuts. Like anything is except for the boy for the manhood or boyhood if you're you haven't hit puberty yet. It's just uh, I don't no. That's for fun time. It's not for pain time. <laughs> yeah. And I hope that we see a rule adaptation at s- sooner rather than later, but certainly at right. least for next season where these things are just simply not accepted at all right. for any it, reason. You're thrown out of the game plus a, a, another game tacked on. I mean, you see, like, you see uh, that spearing is seen as one of the worst things that you could do in the NHL, and that's normally when you, like, stab somebody with the toe of your blade or the or the butt of your stick. But... <laughs> I mean, just move. I don't know. I, I feel like that. Marty McSorley is reviled for being a chronic spear, and I literally can't remember or even pull up a highlight of him spearing somebody else's nuts. Now I'm sure he did it. No, but exactly. I mean, all all his most notorious ones are to the face, which isn't really any better, no, or to the gut. They're all nefarious, and none of them are to the nuts. Right, that's why it's just it's just so utterly ridiculous that the that all of a sudden in this playoffs all you see a bunch of NHL players just going for each other's nuts and it's ridiculous. I don't think that this is a new trend. I think that this is just new to um new to our eyes in terms of this volume. The volume of this is new. I Maybe think- that's what it is. It's the volume, not necessarily the act itself. Yeah. But, um, wow, this is just all kinds of fuck the F up. Yep. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think, I think, it, I think it's kind of interesting though, because this is gonna, I'm gonna segue into another segment we have too. Segway segment, that was awful English, I apologize. Um, oh, it's all right. No, it's. My like, over under was 11 You're, but, no, my, I mean, I think, I, I don't, I wanna say over under 13. We're at 7 or 8 now. I don't know, 13. Yeah, I'm just going to go with said 11 because, you know, the one. You know. Right, right. Um, but no, you also you also see, I don't get it what it is, but I seriously think that the NHL, and specifically its players, all of a sudden just have the same mentality and all of them do it. Because you see, we never, I mean, again, we just, even though we might not have seen it to this volume, but it was never heard of for players that, go out, thrust their stick in between the legs of another player to hit them in the mm-hmm. groin. But now you're also seeing what the hell is this idea 
of squirting players with water bottles. Like, first it was Perry into somebody's glove. I think it was Garba. Carter. Carter. And, oh, yeah, and yeah, the Carter. way that, it, and when Perry did it to Carter, it was more, uh, gestury. Playful, right, exactly. And that's, that's fine. And then you have, um, you it was to be annoying Sean rather Gordon. than to be, rather than to be, um, destructive. Right. And then yeah. you have Sean Thornton that comes in and just squirts PK while he's in the middle of a play. And it's like, okay, come on, dude. Like, you're a pe- you could be a pest on the ice, but you don't need to be a pest off the ice too. Like, I don't know. I just saw it as a little immature. And then freaking King Hendrick squirting whoever that yeah. was during the squirmish. It's like, what the hell? Is everybody just deciding to sit around a bonfire smoking weed and come up with all these ridiculous ideas to piss each other off? Like, I don't get it. I want to break those three examples down. So we're in agreement that Perry was just trying to be a nuisance, a jester uh, to Carter. Because- right, and I think I think those two are friends as well, because they both played on Team Canada as well. And while Jeff Carter, his quote was that Corey Perry is very annoying, even in real life, he, my impression was that he said it as a friend. So as well as, so let me get this straight. During a TV timeout, they're both standing an arm's length away from each other at their respective benches. Um, Perry has the bottle. Carter looks in the other direction, and he squirts a little water inside the glove. Like, Annoying, yes. Please don't do that again, obviously. Big deal, no way. Exactly. Uh, King Henrik and Sidney Crosby, I mean, there's just no... I, again, is is that wrong with a capital W? No. But come on, man. Let's, right. let's, let's act like adults. Exactly, yes. I, I found it immature. Um... As well as, it's very unsanitary, like... <laughs> it's like, water, though. Like, it's not that bad. Well, I'm sure that King Henrik doesn't have syphilis or SARS or HIV, but, like, there's there's the sanitary aspect of it. Like, when you get it on your hand, you kind of wipe it off. But, like, when it's in your face, you want to take a shower. Uh, uh, maybe that's just me. All right, but obviously... Sean Thornton on PK is one where you've got to drop a hammer if you're the legislative branch in uh in the NHL because squirting water in somebody's face, like we just said with Henrik and, and Crosby, not a big deal. It's right. just water. Right. And it's just a squirt. However, when you are off the ice, you are no longer in the field of play. You are no longer supposed to be impactful with your physical actions on the field of play, which is obviously the ice. That's the line. Mm-hmm. He crossed a line as well as did it dangerously because he squirted a PK in the face near the eyes. And it doesn't matter where in the face, but he did it in an area that is obviously distracting. Conversely, if he did it uh, at his chest or on his pants, I mean, he probably doesn't get noticed, but it's not an area that distracts your senses. And I don't know if you know this, Jacob, but in hockey, it's really important to see. I actually had no idea that that was important. I I always thought thought closing your eyes was the best way to to score a goal. I mean, it's the best way to hit a fastball in in baseball, so why not, right? Exactly. They're, They're exactly the same, so... That's what, those are the two elements where this becomes screwed up because you are impacting somebody's safety and from a place where you are no longer part of the play. Mm-hmm. And that's why this, it's, it, it's not going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. And so it's not going to happen, but no, he was fine. Oh, okay. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. He was fine. 28,000. I think actually Lundquist was fine as well. Yeah. 5k. Yeah, yeah, so he was fine, but it was like, you only can get fined of like half of what you make on a daily basis. So no. Thornton's was more of his annual salary, but less money total, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a difference. Yeah, because is somebody being paid, uh, fined based off their per diem, their, uh, their normal paycheck, their yearly salary, like, like what's the percentage? Right. 
Okay, so in any event, uh, I I really liked what PK said in his post game press conference. Is that he said that it's not a big deal that Thornton did it to me, but if I would have done it to somebody else, it would have been top. It would have been breaking. It would have been top story for the next three days. Segway master strikes again, and isn't that absolutely correct? And hasn't oh, he already sure. been? Has it, hasn't he already been a primary story just based on the color of his skin? I don't want to turn this entirely into another racist talk because we've said it and we've been there. But when can hockey join twenty the 21st century? Just let me know. Let me know when hockey can join the 21st century when it comes to all the stupid bullshit from the 20th century that obviously comes with us still. You know, the anti-Soviets, the anti-Europeans, being a pussy, being a loudmouth, being a showboater, being black, not being American, not being Canadian. When can all this bullshit stop? Just, I, I want to know, because if I have, like, an end date in mind, maybe I can grow a little extra tolerance for all this craziness. Yeah, I don't really know. I mean, I think it's, I just think that uh, with PK, I think the NHL just in general, and we've talked about it already, is this, they don't have, it seems like they always like to squash personality. Oh, do they ever? And if you just don't have a personality, you're going to be safer. And then when you do, the media loves it and they blow it up. And then the NHL is like, no, that's bad. Um, so I, I don't know. I think that it's just, it's ridiculous that I, I think PK is totally, totally right. And I don't really know how, I think it's all a mentality of just let him be. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's more, I don't think it's because PK is black. I think it's just because he, he has a big personality, and then he just happens to be black, which is just another aspect that people can latch onto. Um, That's fair. I just, yeah, I don't know. I think that, I mean, I don't think, at least in my eyes, it's we're we're not like anti-European anymore, anti-Soviets. Like we all know the Russians are good. It's just, oh it's, no, come on! Does anybody do get more shit than Ovechkin after scoring fifty goals? But I think it's because of his personality. I don't think it's because he's Russian. I mean, I think that okay, like guys like Mike Milbury and Don Cherry, they still they still do their own thing. But that's because they're just old fucks who haven't. Oh, and that's an important distinction because I was grouping them in. Exactly. They're just. It's it's also like it's going back to the Donald Sterling thing. It's like you act like this is the first time some eighty year old fuck decided to say something racist. Like no, that happens all the time. He's it's just the time that he grew up in, and that doesn't make an excuse. It's just. That's what the reality is. And I think it's the same with Milbury and Cherry growing up in the Cold War, saying that playing hockey in the Cold War and coaching, and that's like, oh, Soviet's bad. They're going to destroy the world, and they're all communists. Like, I know that it's it's fun, especially it was, it was, a, it was a nice kind of storyline back this year in the 2014 Olympics when we were back in Russia, and it's like, oh, the Cold War is coming back again, blah, blah, blah. Damn those Soviets instead of Russians. Like, but... I don't think it was something that people actually took seriously. I, I know at least where the the fans I was watching it for, we all made it as a joke and it wasn't like anything serious. Um, but I just, I don't know. I think that at least the generate, I think it's just a generational thing that as this, the younger generation of fans comes up my age and your age, it's going to be a lot more. You're not going to see this anymore and you're not going to see it. And I once we so. get into those, those broadcasting and the, the media where we define what the, what people see, it's, it's, you're not going to see it anymore. I hope so, brother. I really do. And you know what? I'm adding PK Subban to my list of jerseys I want to have. That's fair, because I think he's, he's a great one. Oh, uh, yeah. And you know what? I hope, I hope someday real soon that he gets to wear the captain's C. Ah. Uh, that would oh, yeah. be so cool. I think I think he does. As soon as Gianta is out of Montreal, PK gets to see. I think it's going to happen. Maybe. They, they could give it to Kovalev again. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that uh, buffoonery, let's uh, shift over to our final topic, sir. Actually, we have two topics. So, sir, let us shift over to the St. Louis Blues and their topics of discussion. 
Did you know that Kirk Muller has signed on a two-year deal to be an assistant coach with the St. Louis Blues? I did. I was actually going to ask Patrick what he thought of that, but then we kind of got off off that range of, of talking about the coaches, so it wasn't a big deal. But, yes, I did see Kirk uh, Muller was announced as the assistant coach for the St. Louis Blues. Any thoughts, feelings, or opinions? Um, honestly, not really, because, uh, I think that it's, I think it'll be, there'll be more th- thoughts and opinions on it once we get the entire coaching staff together. Um, however, uh, I do think that it's gonna, it's going to be something that the Blues are gonna be able to add on to, on top of Ken Hitchcock, because I think, Mil- uh, he's more of a, uh, more of the offensive sort of minded, so it'll be nice to kind of counteract Hitch's, uh, defensive first mentality. Um, exactly. but I think that it's, I think you're going to be able to have a more overarching view of the, of the Blues' front, uh, coaching staff once, uh, once the other hires are made. Alright, and fun fact, Muller is familiar with Hitchcock as he played for him with the Dallas Stars in the final four years of his playing career and was a key veteran on the Stars Stanley Cup final team in 2000. This Fantastic. From, yes, this is from J- Joe Yurden. Pro hockey talk. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so that's having that familiarity. I mean, I figured there was going to be some sort of, uh, of familiarity with assistant coaches and, and Hitch just because that's the way teams like to do it and things like that. Um, but yeah, I think that's nice that we have that, uh, that, that the Blues are, are making steps in the right direction. But yeah, it's. Speaking of making moves in the right direction, how about Spezza being traded to the St. Louis Blues? <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know if the Blues want to take on – well, I don't know how much of a contract they would have to take up on Spezza. But um, I don't know. I just – to me, it's this doesn't seem like a Blues move, if that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. Like, it's just – I mean, the Blues have never – I mean, besides Miller this past year, the Blues have never really been a team that – Goes absolutely all in on, on this on the big name guy for a big name contract, and uh, I think that it's yeah. See, four million for fourteen fifteen. I mean, maybe no. That's four million uh, real money, right? Yeah, because it's uh, a seven mil so cap seven hit. Seven mil cap hit. Uh, seven mil cap hit. He has a he has one season left. Right. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's exactly what he, this is exactly, uh, what he says, and that he doesn't think that there is a 31 or 32 year old veteran player who's gonna come here and reinvent the wheel for the Blues. No, I, I agree. I think we're looking for a guy that's gonna be a little bit younger, who is gonna add a scoring touch for years to come, not necessarily the last year on a contract before he possibly goes somewhere else. That's why I don't think I don't think Spets is the right move. I think a guy like Paul Stassi is the right move, a guy who can score and who can sign on for the Blues for a while and be a part of the core that we need for us to take a run at the Cup. I agree with you, hundred percent. Good. All right, let's move on to our final topic. Let's do it. The New York Rangers and Dan Biles my future. Let us start with everybody's favorite team, the New York Rangers. Yes, sir. We're going to win today. We're totally winning game seven tonight. I want you to win game seven so bad. Oh, when you texted me on Sunday during Mother's Day, uh, I'd already known that the Rangers were up 2 nothing because uh, my buddy's father uh, excitedly shouted it. You know, yeah. I'd already expressly asked to not do that, but whatever it was fine. Um, that was the first time that I can recall easily, happily passing up watching a Rangers playoff game live. Uh-huh. That that's it. I, I the gravity of that statement. It's okay. It's, it's no. I mean, it's yeah. I totally get it too, because I mean, it's Mother's Day, and there's no. I don't know. I feel like it's you should be spending time with your family on Mother's Day, mm-hmm. and I feel like that's expected. 
And so that, that's why I, I totally get it. It's still weird, though. Well, I mean, yeah. Not the family it, it, part. It's just playoff. Just missing yeah. a playoff. Yeah, I know. The good news but, uh, is that it's Game 7, so, so you have more games to watch. <laughs> so I want me to win Game 7 as well, sir. We're yes. in agreement. Yes. Well, <laughs> I actually just I just remembered this from uh, – I was I was on I was on a double date and I we were talking about because uh, my friend uh, I had well Claire's a Blackhawks fan and then uh, my friend Evan's a Wild fan so they were talking about the game and I I always remember it's like I'm such at a love hate relationship with this Hawks series right now because on one hand I want the the Wild to win because I'm tired of Blackhawks fans and I want the Blackhawks to lose because then I thought the Blues but on the other hand, I want the Blackhawks to win because I picked the Blackhawks to go to the Stanley Cup Finals in the preseason. And then I looked back and remembered, I had the Chicago Blackhawks over the St. Louis Blues, which could not happen. I forgot about the new playoff series, the playoff format, and the Western Conference Finals. And then the New York Rangers over the Boston Bruins in the Eastern Conference Finals, and then the New York Rangers over the Blackhawks in six for the Stanley Cup final. So I, I'm cheering along hard for the, the Rangers and the Bruins to make my playoff prediction correct. Well, it's good to know that you're not cheering for the Blackhawks simply to make your girlfriend happy. Well, I mean... <laughs> you're all the happiness she needs anyway, sir. Don't worry about it. That makes me sound like such a bad person. <laughs> no, the... Yeah, she's she's fairly new. She's new to the hockey scene, so it's nice it's nice to have for her to uh to be able to cheer for the Hawks and keep it going. It's it's fun, friendly banter between the two of us, figuring out if the Hawks are actually going to win or not. Um, but yeah, she, I mean, yeah. All right, hey, I'm I'm with you. I, all the things that you said sound good to me. Good. I will give my final prediction of how the series will end. It will be the Kings in seven. It will be the Wild in seven. Yes, Wild in seven. It will be the uh, Habitants in seven. And it will be your New York Rangers in seven. Man, when was the last time all four series have gone to a game seven? It's an interesting question, and um, I don't know. I don't know if it's ever happened. Well, you know, NBC Sports Network will, will definitely let you know if that if it ends up happening. So will Twitter. Yes. So will Twitter. All right, let's, let's move on to our final topic, Dan. Oh, am, uh, I allowed, am I not allowed to have my playoff predictions? You most certainly are. I am so sorry. I sincerely, I apologize. Please continue. No, it's fine. I have the Anaheim Ducks in seven. I have the Wild in seven. I have the Rangers in seven on an overtime goal scored by Rick Nash. Oh, wouldn't that be so sweet? And then I have the Boston Bruins in seven. And that is well, right. at least the Rangers will have won. Yes. All right. Well, somebody's going to be correct. Yes, at least yes, and more, on a couple of uh, on a couple of them, somebody will be correct. No. Dan Bilesmo's future. Uh, let's let's keep this simple. Yep. Regardless of what happens tonight, should he retain his job? I say yes because the way I view his um, tenure as a coach is that he has spent at least half the time without at least one of Malkin or Crosby, and almost all of the time. He has had a porous bottom half of his roster. The Penguins are one of the most top-heavy teams we've seen in a long time. And look at how distinctly successful they've been over that time. Now, there's no excuse to, to losing one series after you uh, lead three games, to low, three games to one, let alone two. But... As the video shows, Dan Bilesma has figured out how to squeeze every last bit of victory out of this roster. From game one to game final, he's one of the best coaches. 
I think he should keep his job and that Ray Shiro perhaps should be more questions. I, I actually have to agree 100%. I don't think that Dan Balswell should be fired, especially when you look, not necessarily over the course of this year, but over the course of what he's done with the Penguins. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, everybody will accept often, uh, postseason success as a standard for how a coach should be done. But, I mean, he's always consistently been a top five, top six team in the NHL. Yeah, and the whole league. Yeah. And then also look at it this year. He's, I mean, he's made it to the, the conference semifinals. And if, I mean, regardless if he went, if he wins, he makes it to the Eastern Conference Finals last year. They made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, in 2012, I, uh, don't really remember what happened there. They, they were up three games to one over Tampa in round two. Oh, then they Tampa came back. Yeah. So I, uh, yeah, I don't think it's necessarily him. I think it's also the players and ability to close. Cause if you look at it, it seems like that they have a lot of trouble closing out series. And I don't think that's a reflection on the coach. I mean, it might be, but. It could be the, uh, it could just be the players just getting complacent back on the heel. And then as soon as the team starts surging, they get back on the heels and they just can't do it. Got to take the San Jose approach and not overreact. Exactly. I agree. And that's why I don't think, I, I, I don't think that Balsma is going to get, uh, is going to get tossed, nor should he. No, I don't think that he will be either. And I think that the Penguins would much rather work with what is stable. Then try and create a new kind of stability. You know, right. all right. Um, but regardless, tonight is going to be a hell of a night. The Rangers, whoo, this is going to be something. This is going to be one of the best games of the whole NHL schedule. Oh my God. Should I drink? Should I make sure I stay stone cold sober so that I can fully appreciate every moment of tonight's game. Uh, I think, uh, see, I don't know because I totally get like wanting to, to just stay stone cold and so that way you can fully remember and fully enjoy the thing 100%. However, I do think that drinking, especially for sporting events is a lot of fun, especially when you do it with other people. Because as you, I think as you drink more, you get more and more into the game and your emotions get more and more high. And it's a more of an up and down. Like, I think you get so much more into a game when you actually drink than when you don't. And I think it's the, I think the way you do it is you ride the buzz for the entire game. You don't get drunk, but you have a couple of beers or a couple of drinks in order to just ride the buzz so that way you're feeling good the entire time. That's a damn good reason to drink in my book. Yeah, because that, I, that's what I have found is if you, if you, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm going into a little bit of a story time. Um, what is it? There, there's a few basketball games on Marquette. It's where you ride the buzz and it's fantastic, but you have to kind of watch it because there was one game, uh, there was one time I decided I was going to take a shot for every, oh, it was a, it was the World Series game three with the, uh, Cardinals and Red Sox. The Blues are playing some team, and Mizzou was playing South Carolina. And I decided that for every time Mizzou scored a touchdown or kicked a field goal, every time the Cardinals scored a run, and every time the Blues scored a goal, I was going to take a shot. And that was not smart because I was down for the count by like 10.30. <laughs> so don't go that far, but definitely ride the buzz because it'll be, it'll be a lot of fun. Well, I've already gone down the, the path of drinking very heavily during the giant second defeating of Tom Brady. And that was, I remember a lot of that. And that was awesome. So I guess I'm going to the beer distributor when we're done. Do it. All right. Well, speaking of which, sir, we've been talking for a long time. Yes, we have, but not as long as some of our other ones, which is, I'm, I love you, but I'm kind of grateful for that it didn't take two and a half hours this time. Yeah, yeah, we're 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 simpatico on that one. Yeah. All right, bud. I love you. It's been a pleasure. Till next time. See ya.